Apple announces the machine learning journal. Google is using its own machine learning to smarten up your news feed. And Micah Sargent is here to talk smart air conditioners, how to improve your Amazon Echo's voice recognition, and he has some spectacles he'd like to tell you about. All that and so much more coming up on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1813, recorded Wednesday, July 19th, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. With Ring, you can see and talk to anyone at your door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. It's like caller ID for your home. Go to ring.com slash TNT and get up to $150 off a Ring of Security kit. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show we tell you what you need to know about technology. I am Megan Maroney. Jason Howell is on vacation all this week, but joining me today is Micah Sargent, writer at iMore, podcaster at Relay FM, and father of chihuahuas. Welcome back to the show, Micah. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be back. I didn't think it was going to be this soon, and now I'm here. <laughs> I know. I was. It was very exciting to talk to you last week, and I thought, well, let's have you back. And we have lots of Apple stories and Google stories and, and many other different machine learning stories. So let's get started. Apple just launched a new machine learning site at machinelearning.apple.com. Volume one, issue one of the Apple Machine Learning Journal is available to read now if you're interested in how using large data sets can increase the set of your, the success of your neural net. What I'm more interested in is why Apple chose now to be more worth, forthcoming about its forays into artificial intelligence. Russ Salakudinov, Apple's relatively new director of AI research announced last year at a conference that the company planned to share more on this front. But how much, Micah, do you think the impetus of this journal is proving that they're as advanced in AI than Google or Amazon? Oh, boy. So, you know, I think that we are just now kind of getting into every, if, if a company isn't talking about machine learning, if they don't say that word on stage at their conferences, if, if it doesn't come up, then uh, people are going, are you like here in the future with us? Because I don't think you are. Uh, so part of this, I think, really is Apple going, you know, we're, we're doing this too. And I think that, you know, this is something that they've obviously been, obviously been working on for a time. Other uh, tech companies have been as well. And we're just kind of now getting to a place where everybody sort of kind of knows what machine learning is. And so when you say machine learning, people go, oh, OK, I, I get what that is. Um, and, you know, from reading the blog, because I tried to read the blog post and as I'm going through, it's getting more and more and more and more confusing. So I'm like, clearly, Apple definitely knows what it's talking about here because this is all over my head. Yeah, I mean, they're written by uh, Apple engineers. When I was looking into this, it looks like this was posted somewhere else this this uh piece but then it was even simplified i tried to read it too and i got only so far despite the fact that there are gifts i only got so far <laughs> in, in reading it um but i think it's also a job posting it was also a job posting they have an email address if you want to uh, participate in this and if you want i mean everyone's constantly looking for experts in machine learning and AI. So I think this was also kind of a reaching out to say, like, who who, who knows about this stuff? Who can come and help us? Mm -hmm. I think you are spot on there. I mean, as I was reading this, I kind of did see it less as a, hey, public, check out what we can do, and really more of a, hey, people who are good at this kind of thing, look at what we're doing here. You should come work with us. And yeah, down at the bottom, you can see jobs at Apple and you can click apply now. It shows some of the different stuff that they're doing. And then, yeah, they say write us at machine-learning at apple.com if you have questions, thoughts, et cetera. So they're kind of like feeling it out, looking for people who would be good for this. And I think that uh, yeah, this is certainly Apple's way, another way for Apple to look for experts in the field. Because I think if I'm someone who knows a lot about machine learning, which I'm not, um, then I'm going to be looking for companies that clearly know what they're doing and are doing exciting things and 
you know, things that make me want to be there and, and say, that's the company that I'm going to go with because I'm going to do my best work there. Mm-hmm. And uh, Saul Kudinoff is from Carnegie Mellon. It's unclear if he, I mean, I looked on his uh, profile on, I think, Twitter, and he said he's still a Carnegie Mellon professor. So I don't know if that's, if he's doing both right now. But I mean, professors in the field are traditionally, especially in a field like machine learning, they they constantly share their data um, because, you know, they, they're crowdsourcing a lot of this as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, whenever you're doing studies, a good study is one that's been peer reviewed. And if it's not peer reviewed, then everybody out there should be asking questions. You know, is this legitimate? Is this good stuff? Because a peer reviewed journal and peer reviewed studies are what make uh, the best information essentially that we have. And so looking at this and, and knowing that it's kind of coming from people who do these studies and who work in this sort of field, uh, constantly. That's what makes it a, a, a good and exciting thing. Again, I, I feel like these are all just sort of not red flags, I guess, green flags for uh, people who want to be doing machine learning stuff. And they, they go along and they see this kind of thing and go, oh, wow, I certainly would love to take synthetic imagery and make it look so real that even uh, other machine learning systems are fooled by the fact that it's fake. They think that it's real, uh, which is what I understand this to be. Uh, like as I was digging through it, I don't know what you thought, Megan. Uh, yeah, I think that's sort of what it, it was. That's what I thought it meant. Yeah, <laughs> good, good. We're on the same page. <laughs> Well, uh, machine learning that we can understand uh, came from Google today. They made some updates to their search app on iOS and Android in order to offer you a steady stream of what Google thinks you want to know before you search for it. Google will deliver articles, videos, and other customized content right to your own personal filter bubble as soon as you turn this feature on. To get this kind of personalized content, you'll have to have web and app activity and location history turned on, not surprisingly, uh, I turned it on and I immediately got a bunch of stories about the Amazon Echo, Marie Kondo. She is <laughs> the the woman that you have to touch all your stuff and decide if it brings you joy or not. And I'm always looking at that on the internet, apparently. And the Women's March got a lot of stories about that. Google's machine learning, I guess, just gets me. Uh, except what I want to know, why can't this all be integrated into one app? Like I have the Google Assistant app. We talked about that yesterday. These are two separate apps. Plus there's even the the Chrome app, which is another separate app. I don't understand why they have to have all these different apps. I honestly would have expected that you got some pressure pot news as well. Oh, um, Instapot, <laughs> yeah. That reminds me. I owe you and Tanya and several other people a lot of uh, the recipes that I've been sent sent about <laughs> the Instapot. No, I, I did not get any Instapot or pressure pot mm. or anything like that. Well, that's probably just going to require some training. Uh, mm-hmm. No, I'm with you. I, I think that... Um, it would be nice to have everything all built into one app. And honestly, it's interesting because for the most part, the iOS app does seem to build in a lot of this stuff into one location. And, you know, you can scroll through the little Google part and kind of see what you're looking for and do voice search and all that jazz and get that information. Um, but yeah, to have to have the Google Home app that controls the Google Home that's behind me, to have the uh, Google Assistant, all those different apps just trying to vie for my attention. If I have everything in one place, then I'm more likely to use it. Because right now, I get like notifications from the news app for iOS, and I, I don't know if I need to have another app that's trying to give me the news. And frankly, I, I use uh, Twitter for that a lot of the time. But if Google can take what it already knows about me, which it knows a lot because I use the search features uh, to find stuff all the time, then, you know, I could kind of see how this is an interesting uh, possibility. And honestly, I'll give it a try. You know, I want to give it a test and see how good its machine learning is and whether it can pick out stories that maybe I didn't even think of. Well, you know, I made a joke about the filter bubble earlier. And of course, we all know what that is when, you know, Facebook is the worst at this. Just delivering us the news that we only want to see, things we already, you know, the confirmation bias kind of mm-hmm. news. And it did, I, I will give it credit that several articles about the Women's March were negative articles. Some criticism that the Women's March is getting, you know, in places from like the National Review. Stuff that I wouldn't necessarily seek out. So I will give... Uh, credit that it's not necessarily showing me the publications that I always look at, but maybe the topics, which is good because I, I want to hear from different views. I don't I don't like that I'm, you know, in this West Coast bubble. I wish I weren't. Um, but so I think that that's good. I You know, you've made a point that I didn't realize before that you can get voice search 
from this app. I because Google Assistant is how I do. I like I prefer Google Maps to Apple Maps, so I use that to navigate places. And yeah, I just um, I just three D touched on the Google app. And I, it's interesting. I've seen this. I don't know if you've seen this. It's actually, um, I see popular right now and trending. And it's actually, I've never seen a 3D Touch app uh, be move like, um, not constant. What's the word? Is it animating? Yeah. I don't know if you can see really? that, Ryan. But <clears throat> see, the, yeah, the trending topic. Oh, wow. Be, I know. And that was just I don't think I've ever seen that before either. So, huh. and it's weird that it's a Google app. So, yeah, I mean- <laughs> Uh, I'm not that interested in the stories. Um, well, yeah, San Diego Comic-Con, Star Wars, I am. But also there was a Colin Kaepernick article that I'm not going to read. So, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I mean, to quickly touch on, on what you had said earlier, uh, the, you know, Google makes a point to mention in their post about it that they are trying to provide diverse perspectives. And I think that's important for more than one reason. Of course, for the reason of not being stuck in a bubble and by getting Getting out of our bubble, we become more empathetic human beings in general and are able to put ourselves in other people's shoes, which I realize is redundant. But um, that being able to do that is so important when it comes to at least understanding where other people might be coming from on topics. And so I'm glad that Google's doing that. But on top of that, they're also paying attention to sources that continually put out false news um, and are maybe not reputable sources. So there's fact checking going on as well. And I think that both of those things working together, providing a diverse perspective, but also saying, hey, you know, there are some fact errors in this and there continue to be. So maybe we won't show these sources as much. All of that provides a more excellent experience. I agree. Well, the U.S. government will ease restrictions on self-driving cars, according to legislation that passed the House Commerce Consumer Protection Subcommittee by voice vote. Automakers can now manufacture up to 100,000 autonomous vehicles a year, according to new federal standards, which will preempt existing state laws. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, will oversee development and testing, and the House Energy and Commerce Committee will vote on the bill next week. The new urgency for driverless car laws comes from the steady increase in traffic fatalities. According, according to Reuters, road deaths in the United States rose 7 0.7% in 2015. That was the highest annual jump since 1966. And I think we're already at 8% raise in, in 2017. So um, yeah, I mean, people are getting that no matter how scared you are of robot cars, you should be more scared of human drivers. <laughs> 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 yes. And that's so frustrating because there are so many people who I think don't get that. Like it seems to be such a, a contentious point to say that let's let robots control our, uh, our driving experiences because humans are so distracted by so many things that we have to, you know, bring new features like do not disturb, uh, while driving to iOS and, and, uh, Android's system for for blocking off notifications while you're driving. We're so easily distracted. We're also incredibly selfish just as human beings in general. And so we think we can do a hundred things, even though it means making other people unsafe and ourselves unsafe. So, you know, like seeing somebody play a trombone while they eat a turkey dinner while doing their makeup is <laughs> common and it's ridiculous. And so we have instead a vehicle that literally it's it, it doesn't play a trombone. It doesn't do its makeup. It's not eating a, a turkey dinner. It's just focused on driving. And that's what's going to be, I think, in the future so great. And right now we have people so focused on when these robots mess up. But then we look at how many deaths have occurred because of humans and distracted driving and how many injuries have occurred because of humans and distracted driving and also, you know, being intoxicated. It's it's uh, it's just it's so much different. And so I'm genuinely hopeful for that future. And I'm glad that uh, lawmakers are kind of coming together to work on it and make it a reality. Yeah, I mean that, yeah, you put it well, they are coming together to make it a reality, working together. Of course, I mean, they're, you know, we've seen how slowly Washington is working, so they still have to, uh, I mean, self-driving cars might get to the roads faster than this bill gets voted on, so we'll have to see. And Mike in the chat room says that self-driving cars are nowhere near safer than humans right now, and that is absolutely true, but we have to have this regulation um, now so that people can mm -hmm. make them safer um, and doing it states state by state was really messy. And so I think uh, having federal laws is a better idea in my opinion. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that. Um, I think that 
the the it, it at least gives all these companies that are trying to do this up an easier way to make the testing happen so that we can improve upon this technology and we can eventually stop worrying about things like trying to get home safe at night on a Friday or Saturday or around holidays when people make unwise decisions. Mm -hmm. And Burke, who uh, is always right about everything, has something to say as a motorcyclist. He says he almost gets run off the road at least once a month by a driver looking at phone and autonomous cars are safer than someone looking at their phone. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Burke, who is always right about everything. <laughs> now, I firmly believe that in the not so distant future, we will buy nothing from anyone except for Amazon. The only difference will be how <laughs> will we buy it through our Echoes, through our computer, through a Whole Foods, or how about from the back of a truck? According to GeekWire, <laughs> Amazon has a patent for a treasure truck where people order things online and pick them up from an elaborately decorated truck that also sometimes gives you free candy. The truck was limited to Seattle, but soon it's coming to a city near you. TechCrunch says they're not going on a road trip. They'll be parked in a specific location. So aside from just the fact that Amazon is moving everywhere uh, all the time and I am completely buying into it, there's two things about this story. One, I mean, I think we've taught, we've all been taught and taught our children not to accept free candy uh, <laughs> from someone in a truck. And also, I mean, <laughs> I was also brought up to not buy things off the back of a truck. <laughs> and yet, what do you think about the treasure truck? I mean, literally, that's exactly what I was going to say. Uh, where'd you get that? It fell off the back of a truck and they gave me free candy. <laughs> what? Uh, no, this this is exciting. It's interesting, especially for people who like uh, like Amazon, like buying from Amazon. And, you know, there's, there's a bit of excitement and fun to it. But, yeah, on the face of it, it's sort of a ridiculous thing. And I think that's why, part of the reason at least, why Amazon kind of had trouble getting it going in the beginning. Because it... It's just kind of a bizarre concept. Like, I'm going to buy something online at a way reduced price, and then I'm going to go meet a truck somewhere where it's parked <laughs> outside of a park or something. Like, what? Um, but, you know, it's still, it's cool. Again, it's fun. And I think that that's kind of what Amazon is relying on here is, is the sort of fun aspect. And I'm not certain if, you know, they can uh, sort of get away with some skirt some some tax laws or something like that as well because like it wasn't too long ago that here in my state I had to start paying uh, taxes on my Amazon products because they set up a f uh, facility here and so I don't know if maybe where the treasure truck is as long as it have facilities people still don't have to pay taxes not sure how all that works so maybe there's some reasonable uh, logical reasons for having a treasure truck and not just the fact that it's a fun haha -ha thing. <laughs> Right. Or just like location. I mean, that's that's the uh, everyone in the chat room is pointing out that, yes, you uh, food. What about food trucks? Yes, I love food trucks. I buy lots of food from food trucks. Big fan. of. I don't the get taco. free candy from. Food no, trucks, I don't. Though. But I'm a big fan of the taco from a truck. But I'm talking about electronics falling off the back of a truck. That's something that my family has told me never to buy. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and that's why, you know, food trucks have have. They, they have success because they're not in like, you know, a, a single location and, you know, paying rent and mm -hmm. they can be more flexible in that way. So, so maybe that's what they're after. Yeah. And I, I mean, the, the experience is still a little different. It's, it's not like, you know, an ice cream person where you walk up to the truck and you say, you, you look around and you pick out what you want and then, you know, you open it up and the gumballs are like way down at the bottom and it doesn't even look like the cartoon character that you ordered. Oh, wait, that's a side. Um, but <laughs> it, you know, you, you have to order online, you got to get it quick and, you know, there'll be a discount on it. And so it, ultimately, I think that this is just a fun thing. And yes, there are lots of like positive reasons. But the reason that I would go to it is because it's like, this is kind of cool. Where are you headed? I'm headed to meet the treasure truck. Like, that's just fun. <laughs> right. It's exactly like the, the same reason I order paper towels from my Amazon Echo, because it's really fun to just say, order me that. And then even though it comes and it costs $50 for one roll of paper towels. <laughs> and the, the mail person is always angry because it's this huge box, like bulk paper towels. They yes. set it down. Yeah, uh. exactly. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, after the break, is it hot enough for you? Micah has some tips on smart air conditioners. But first, let's take a minute to thank Ring, the sponsor of this episode. Ring's mission is to make neighborhoods safer. Today, over a million people use the amazing Ring video doorbell to help protect their homes. Ring knows how home security begins at the front door 
but it doesn't end there. That's why they're extending that same level of security that you got from the Ring video doorbell to the Ring floodlight cam. So just like the video doorbell, floodlight cam is a motion activated camera and the floodlight that connects to your phone. It has HD video, looks great. You can really see the wrinkles on that person's face as they're coming to steal your stuff. And it has two-way audio, which lets you know the moment anyone steps on your property. This is my favorite part. You can see and speak to visitors through your light bulb. That is amazing. Of all the things I've wished for, speaking through to someone, whether I'm upstairs, not wanting to answer the door or I'm across the world, I can speak to whoever's coming, whether they're a welcome visitor or not. You can do that right from your phone. With Ring's floodlight cam, when things go bump in the night, you will immediately know what it is. If it's your kid coming home late or if it's a deer about to eat the flowers that you planted, you can see and maybe give a shout at that deer to make them run away and save your flowers. So whether you're home or away, the Ring Floodlight Cam lets you keep an eye on your house. Ring Floodlight Cam offers the ultimate in in-home security with high visibility floodlights and a powerful HD camera that puts security right in your hands. Plus, zooming and panning so you can get a really good look at who or what is out there. If the zombies are coming, you will be able to see them first through your Ring Floodlight Cam. The Ring Floodlight Cam was named the Wall Street Journal's Best of CES 2017. Monitor every corner of your property with the Ring of Security Kit. All kits include a Ring video doorbell and your choice of either one, two, or three floodlight cams. Connect your Ring video doorbell with your favorite smart locks and hubs for added convenience, monitoring, and security. With Ring, you are always home. And now you can save up to $150 off the Ring of Security Kit. All you have to do is go to ring.com slash TNT. That's ring.com slash TNT. And we thank Ring for their support. So growing up in Texas, it was not uncommon for me to bring a sweatshirt to the mall to keep me warm from the ungodly amount of air conditioning that they used. But we have gotten smarter since then. You wrote a piece, Micah, this week on smart air conditioners. Let's start with the frigid air window unit. What did you think of that one? Oh, that one is very pretty. Um, in fact, it was like the prettiest one that I came across. It, it's interesting. The, there's a difference, of course, between like smart air conditioners themselves. And then uh, like in my case, I have central air and, and heating and cooling and all that stuff. So I just use uh, a smart thermostat. But they actually make window units that have smarts built in. And for the most part, whenever some whenever some company puts the word smart before something, it just means that it connects to the Internet somehow or can connect directly to a, vo a device through Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. So uh, so so do you so if someone already has uh, central air, then um, then what do you recommend for them? <laughs> Yeah, that, this would not be, uh, if you already have central air and you control everything via a thermostat in your house and you're wanting to smarten things up, I personally like the Ecobee, Ecobee. Uh, that, that device is really neat because of the fact that it's HomeKit enabled, which for me is an important thing because I use Apple's ecosystem personally, um, but it also works with all of the different smart assistants. And the best thing about it is it has room sensors. And so what they do is they work with the thermostat to determine occupancy, to determine temperature, and they use all of that information to kind of uh, better understand the, the temperature inside of your house and where you might be. So, you know, if the bedroom is 75 degrees and wherever the thermostat is it's 72 degrees it will actually take those temperatures and average them and use that to kind of warm or cool the house depending on what you want and so that makes a better experience because sometimes i can remember especially when i was younger and like i'd be upstairs in my bedroom in my childhood home and it's like hot as can be up there but the the, the bottom floor of course was nice and cool so yeah that in that case, that's what you're going to want. But if you got, if you have a window unit, I personally think that the, uh, if you're going to have to buy a full-on window unit, the Frigidaire is so good looking. Like it's one of the most futuristic ones that we've come across. It's rated really well, and other sites also recommend it. Um, it's a well-reviewed window unit that provides the smarts. It's modern. It it looks nice, and um, I think that you know it, it's not too pricey, which is good as well. And so what if you already have a window unit and uh, you, you say that you can just you plug it into a smart plug? Do you have a smart plug that you recommend? 
Uh, well, okay. There, there are two options here. If you have a window unit or you maybe you don't even need AC. Some of you live in really nice places where mm-hmm. occasionally you just need a fan. How nice. Um, then you can just use a smart plug. Um, you plug that in the wall. You plug whatever device you have into it. And then you can set up, you know, scheduling or whatever you want to do there. And it just turns on. So if you've got a manually controlled window unit or again something like a a fan or or what have you you plug that in it it's already set to the settings that you want it automatically turns on and you're good to go it's running it's happening now if instead you have something that provide you know you want to be able to control it a little bit more deeply anything that runs with a remote can use an ac smart controller so What these do is basically kind of spoof the signal of your remote, and then you can, no matter where you are, if you're in the home, if you're out of the home, you basically hit the buttons on your, in the app, and it sends that information over the internet to that controller. The controller says, okay, I know what I need to do, and then sends the remote signal from itself to your AC unit or your heating unit. So there are plenty of options out there for heating and cooling, depending on how your setup is at home. So yeah, so with the smart plugs, do all of them work not just on your home Wi-Fi? Like if I, uh, you know, like I live in a place where I don't really need air conditioning, but it does get hot sometimes. So if I have a fan plugged into a smart plug and, you know, it's 100 degrees right now and I want to cool off my home starting now on my way home from work, I can just you do that from all the way over here? Well, it depends. Um, So there are multiple factors here. Some smart plugs are going to be Bluetooth enabled. And with those depending on your setup, depending on whether you've got a hub, uh, depending on a whole host of factors, you might be able to control it out of the home. So I'm going to give you a, an example of how you can control it out of the home. You're going to want to find a plug like the one from Elgato Eve. They make, I think it's called the Eve Energy, and it is Bluetooth. But because it's HomeKit enabled, your Apple TV or an iPad that's left at home can serve as the hub that can communicate directly with that device. So even while you're away, you could say, hey, as I approach my home, you know, once I reach inside of this bubble or as I leave work, then go ahead and tell my Apple TV or my iPad to tell the Elgato energy or the Eve energy rather to turn on and that'll turn on. It'll turn on the device. You can also set up for scheduling. If you've got multiple sensors in your home, if you've got maybe a a temperature sensor of some sort, you could just say, Hey, when the temperature drops or rather rises above this temperature, then go ahead and turn on that fan for me or turn on that AC for me. If you've got a Wi-Fi one, chances are it's going to work out of the home just within its own app. So the iDevices plug is an example of one that will work without needing anything else. You plug that in, you get it connected to Wi-Fi, you turn on a setting inside of the iDevices app, and no matter where you are, you can go ahead and pop in and make those controls. And whether you want to set it up with location automation or you just want to be able to turn it off while you're away or turn it on while you're away, you can do that. You have a few other products uh, that you reviewed as well. I don't want to give give it all away, so check <laughs> out Micah's article at, at iMore. And I'm going to ask you a question that I bet you get a lot. And so I think you probably have a good answer. Swarmed in the chat room said, uh, when you said that smart means it's just connected to you know, your phone or whatever, he said smart means it, rec- quote, records your daily life and sells it. So, so what is your <laughs> answer to that when people just say, like, all these devices are just selling my information and is it really worth it? Uh, I mean, there's always going to be some some sort of give and take depending on what devices you're getting. Okay, there, yes, there certainly are devices that are collecting your information and using that anonymous or otherwise uh, to to sell to third parties. Now, if Georgia Dow were here, she would definitely be like saying, "Don't put any of this stuff in your home. Never get on Facebook. Never do this," because she's you know very 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 gung ho about uh, personal privacy. And I think that's fantastic. Uh, I think. It's very important to understand what you're giving up and what you're getting in return when it comes to anything, not just smart home technology, but an app that you use or a service that you use. You are going to be giving something up, whether it be money or it be your personal data. And so in the case of of HomeKit enabled devices, this is one of the kind of uh, pro tips, I guess, that you can go with here. Um, Depending on the type of device, something like the ones that are from Elgato, because they're connected to Bluetooth and because they're HomeKit enabled, you can actually never download the Elgato Eve app and connect it with 
the Elgato Eve app and therefore be able to access it through that and through their third party service. You can actually plug that thing in, connect it to HomeKit and run it completely through that so that your data is Apple and the device. And you may have a better understanding of how those two communicate and where your data is going because it's not being able to connect to anything else and, and communicate that way. Now, I obviously cannot speak for uh, Wi-Fi connected devices and that's where you really got to sit down in your big overstuffed you know, leather chair, you get out the bubble pipe, you get out a cup of chamomile tea and you read through the terms and conditions and you, all the agreements if you want to know exactly how your data is being used, if it's being sold, et cetera, et cetera. I love the idea of someone reading terms of service with a bubble pipe. <laughs> I hope that it's the only way. It really is Otherwise the only you get way. Sad. <laughs> it is the only way. All right. Well, let's move on to Amazon Echoes. They uh, mine have pretty good voice recognition, especially compared to Siri. But you say I could make it even better. How? Yeah. So this is an interesting thing. Um, you know, when I first I, I was talking to uh, our commerce editor about this post and we kind of were going back and forth on what exactly we should do here. And on this one, you know, at first I thought this device is really, really good at hearing me whenever I say the key word that I won't say right now. Um, and I often have not had any issue having it understand me and know what I'm saying. Right. Well, then I thought about it. And I remember that whenever I first moved into the home that I'm in now, I set my Echo up underneath uh, the television in my living room because it actually is the focal point in my living room, which is a no-no if you care about like in interior design. But anyway, I don't care. TV, focal point, everybody's there. And, and it's kind of like centralized. And so I could count on my mouth being uh, facing toward it and you know guests' mouths being faced toward it as well. Seemed like the best place for it to be. However, if you've got the television running and you say the keyword, then suddenly uh, the device that's closer, which happens to be the television kind of piping its speakers into the system, is communicating with the Echo instead of you. And so it can get confused. And, you know, Amazon's really good about making its technology, uh, its voice recognition technology, understand the difference between your voice and other voices. But if a very powerful or loud voice is overcoming yours, then it doesn't do as well. So one of the things to do is get it away from loud sound sources like being underneath the television, Micah, or having it right next to speakers that might be pumping out you know, music or other things that aren't coming directly from it. And by doing that, then it can better understand you. That's one way at least. That, that is a good tip. Yeah, I am, I'm continually amazed, and they've gotten better at this too, that, that it will recognize me when I want it to, but then the rest of the ones in the house don't hear necessarily. Um, they, you know, that it doesn't, it used to be worse. It used to, mm -hmm. I guess they made it, they did an update, right? That, yes. that now it's like the closer, it only responds to the one that's closest to you. Exactly. So yeah, if you have multiple echoes um, and echo dots throughout your home, they've made it smarter to, I, I can't think they've got some name for it, some fancy schmancy name, but basically it's like proximity detection. And so they all kind of know where the other ones are because they've got a bunch of microphones that can listen all at once. And there are, you know, maybe two hear your word, but the one that's closest to you, because it can sense that your voice is louder, then it can use that to kind of say, okay, you know, I'm going to listen. That other one, that's way farther away isn't going to listen it's not going to respond and yeah it's very very good about doing that and you can actually improve upon the technology by hopping into your um, app i won't say the name of the app the alexa app and if you go into the settings and it's it's in the article exactly where you have to go but you go into the settings and there's an option for voice training and so similar to kind of setting up uh, a google voice training or a siri voice training you can also set up voice training for alexa and it gets better at hearing your trigger word and it also gets better at just understanding what you're saying in general so it's a little short training and you know walks through and kind of better understanding the way that you speak and that can also improve upon it now the one thing that's a little bit disappointing is some third-party devices either 
aren't enabled at all with the proximity detection, or if they are, it's not the best. And so I do have a thermostat in my home that does have the ALEXA voice service uh, built in. And sometimes it hears me when I'm talking to my living room echo. And sometimes it responds to and it's, I mean, it's kind of annoying because then you've got like music playing in the hallway and in the living room at the same time and sometimes at different uh, speeds and durations. Yeah, they're not synced up. That's the thing that's that's crazy about it. You know, yeah, it's, I mean, these devices in our home, all over our home, like we can be nervous about them, but it's just like they're really changing just as the, the our smartphones are changing the way we live. Um, I'm continually surprised. At the, so we have the Echo Show and the Amazon Echo, and I haven't figured out. They're, they're both in the kitchen, and one uses one of the uh, the words, the wake words. The other one uses another wake word so uh-huh. that um, <clears throat> I can control them that way. But um, I, I had them both say something. I, I can't even remember. It was a question I asked or something. And they both, you know, they both, I had them, you know, I asked one and then I asked the other. And my daughter said, it's so weird how they have the exact same voice. <laughs> and I just thought that's so funny because she really sees them as two different things. You know, it was weird to her that one is like a box with a screen on it and one is a cylinder. And she thought, well, right. it's, you know, they each have their own personality except for they have the same voice. You know, she, so. <laughs> that is interesting. I mean, that is uh, a matter of uh, how we're starting, I think, younger generations, especially how they begin to understand how we interact with these devices and how they see them. And that's certainly going to, I think, change over time and we'll we'll see improvements there. Um, but I think the idea eventually is to get to a place where we don't have these like individual totems that exist, where we like worship our smart assistants, but they're just everywhere. And so then you don't have to think about them as individual units, but just like this pervasive A-L-E-X-A that can help you no matter where you are in your home without thinking about, you know, I've got my voice in a box over here and my voice in a tower over here and my voice in a tube over here and my voice in a stuffed bear over there, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we're going to talk more about voices later, but uh, I want to ask you about the Snapchat, the Snap Spectacles. Yesterday, we learned that they would be selling the spectacles on Amazon, those things we all waited in line for. Now, regarding spectacles, you tweeted today, these things are pretty fun. If you're into fun things that are fun and cost a little too much, but you like fun, so you buy them anyway, which is an excellent <laughs> description of so many of the things that we love also. Yeah. Um, so these, (laughs) (sighs) look, I, that was basically my way of justifying a ridiculous purchase. I mean, that's honestly, they're, they're so silly. They record circular video. They're kind of fun. They're kind of quirky. And at least in the beginning, it was sort of like having uh, Google Glass, maybe. I'm trying to think of something that like when you had it and you had it early, then people would come up to you and say, is that blah, blah, blah? Because that's what this kind of felt like. Uh, we, we took these to CES um, whenever we were covering the show. And, you know, people were like, oh, are those the new? And it's like, yeah, yeah, they are. And it was kind of an exciting thing. But now, I mean, I have to be honest, they just sit in their really nice case, uh, but in a drawer somewhere because I, I don't, I personally don't really use Snapchat, which I realize makes me a bad millennial, but um, that's like the best place to to have uh, your your video from these things show up because it records circular video and you can export it to other things, but it shows up as a circle. But if you view it in Snapchat, it's kind of an interesting experience because it shows within the rectangle, but you can take your phone and kind of move it around. And that's kind of how it shows the circle. So it provides a little bit more of an experience that can be fun. But ultimately, again, I mean, the the camera that's built into this thing is not great quality, let's see. Um, and, you know, it does a weird little flashy thing and records video and sound, but ah, there's just not too much of a, of a point for them. And because it's so tied into one service, I can't like in good conscience recommend buying this, <laughs> this very expensive product that is not going to be great for most people. <laughs> I think they look great. I don't care what any Ugh. of the people in the chat room were saying about how they look. I think they look great. Oh, dear. I should not look at the chat room. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> They're very nice in the chat room. Oh, okay. So did you wait in line for them? Uh, no. So actually, a, a, co- a co-worker of mine waited in line for me. Um, they were only available for sale. It, it was like, so originally they were only available from a bot 
uh, literally a bot would like appear somewhere and it would drive around and you'd have to like pay money to this bot and then the bot would spit out a pair of spectacles that you could have and that's how you got them but then snapchat opened a pop-up shop in new york and you could go there and buy them um but they this is like the case that it comes in but the interesting thing is that they limited it, I think, to two per person. So he actually had to go back multiple days in a row and wait in line to buy them uh, because my like boss, boss, boss was saying that everybody who was going to CES and it was covering any social stuff needed to have a pair of these. So he was tasked with going multiple days, poor guy, to pick these up. And that's why I have yet to tell him that mine just sit in a drawer now because that would probably <laughs> make him angry. <laughs> okay, so you don't use Snapchat and yet you are so fond of that Snapchat uh, AR hot dog. Look, I am a, a very conflicted human being. I, I, so uh, my, my partner is a big Snapchat user, constantly in Snapchat. And I like to consider him like the, the quintessential um, everyday person who is just like, you know, when, when I need to know if technology is interesting to a normal person, as in someone who's not like steeped in technology like I am, I just ask him. And so, you know, I know that my friends are all into Snapchat and Snapchat is a big thing for my generation and younger generations. I don't get it personally. However, they came out with this really cool augmented reality hot dog. <laughs> And there's just something so delightful about it. It does this little dance and you can like reposition it and it looks like it's in physical space. And so, yeah, I, I mean, Snapchat hot dog is my best friend. Uh, you know, like we go, I'll probably be at Snapchat hot dogs wedding. Um, <laughs> but the, yeah, there's a ridiculous video of me getting a photo with uh, Snapchat hot dog. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I just, I think that it was a delightful addition to the Snapchat app. And it's one of the things that brought me back into it, at least for a little bit of time. We should say it is National Hot Dog Day. So it is. Yes. Happy National Hot yeah, Dog happy Day. Happy National Hot Dog Today too. So do you and your partner have streaks on Snapchat? Uh no, I mean wait, what is that? Is that like okay. a point thing? <laughs> Isn't it like you get points after okay, a while? Okay, let or me. You are you are a horrible I'm so, millennial. You I are really a bad am. millennial. Um <laughs> Streaks. Get off my lawn. <laughs> yes. Uh, streaks are my nemesis. I don't like streaks. I think streaks are the, um, the, they're just like bad corporation, uh, example of just, just bad, the way that corporations are like hacking into our brains. Uh, streaks are, you have it when you chat with someone every day. So it automatically comes up. So if you like not send a, sending a snap necessarily, but doing the chat in Snapchat. So if you have, if you go back and forth and it, you know, it shows streaks. So like you've gone back and forth every day for three days, it says three days, or in the case of my 14 year old daughter for 370 days. So, <laughs> you know, th this is how a lot of kids prove that they're, they're friendships to each other, which, oh, you know, when you really think goodness. about it is, you know, it's, it's kind of the, you know, very dystopian when you think about it. Um, because, you know, sh people, kids have fight with fights with their friends, but they're still keeping up their streak. So it's You're like, it's not me. real. And, um, and I know that Snapchat knows this and I'm sure they have psychologists on their payroll that they, you know, say, here's a way to get this entire generation to stay with us. And, you know, they, when, when kids get grounded and they get their phones taken away, they have someone else sign in with their, uh, password to keep up their streaks. So, you know, are you serious when kids go away to like a camp where they can't have technology, they have someone else keep up their streaks. And, you know, so it's like not only what I've just said, but also like encouraging kids to like, here's my password. Um, you have it. And so that you can be me on the internet for a week so we keep up our streaks oh yeah. i'm so concerned about <laughs> so concerned i uh, so i did not know what streaks were um now i do and it sounds like the most horrible thing that's ever existed uh no well it's it, not that, but <laughs> yeah, I, you, I brian. are those your um, streaks brian no, okay <laughs> oh, I was impressed with those streaks. What an so odd the, name. Uh, the fire is that that's just means a streak, right? Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so I think I actually, I may have even written about this uh, feature. I didn't know that it was called streaks. I probably did it at the time, but yeah, like uh, over time, the emoji changes that's right next to the person's name. Mm -hmm. And you, know, like you start out with a little smiley face or whatever, and new people are a baby face or whatever. Uh, yeah. I will say like, 
everybody who I communicate with, including my partner, knows that I don't use Snapchat. And so if they expected me to communicate with them there, they would never hear from me. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I've, I've set that boundary and I, I just I'm never in the app. So if they wanted to get in touch with me, then they would have to look elsewhere. So I don't think I have a probably a single streak <laughs> at all in the app. But yeah, that's a little concerning for data privacy and um, gamification is a very, very, very powerful thing. And I bet you are dead on the money there about them hiring people who, you know, know how to kind of keep people involved and keep people using the app to get people looking at the ads that, of course, then make them money. Right. I mean, because, you, you know, we're adults, so we understand that, you know, how many times we've Snapchatted someone uh, doesn't really say how close we are in right. real it's, relationships. Right, it's how many times we've retweeted them that says <laughs> exactly. how much we love. Yes, yeah. yeah, that's so true. But, you know, I mean, and, and but kids don't, their brains aren't fully formed and they're still figuring this stuff out and there's nothing, you remember what it was like to be a teenager, there's nothing more important than like figuring out who's in your tribe, who's mm -hmm. your clan, who are your real friends, who are your frenemies, you know, all those things. And to have like a giant technology company come in and try to define that for you because there are all kinds of other weird things it's like it there's a label for people who snapchat you a lot more than you snapchat them you know and there's you know just <laughs> like all all of these things that you are obsessed with as a teenager and when you're an adult you grow out of so i'm hoping that this generation that are really into to streaks will eventually become adults and realize wasn't that a funny thing we did kind of like you know hacky sack or exactly um, probably beanie leg babies warmers. and <laughs> yeah, like it, I, I'm sure that, you know, every generation, because we always are going to look on to the next generation and say, oh, that's ridiculous that they have this and they do that. But yeah, I think we all had or have our things that were ridiculous. And I guess, I don't know, mine would have probably, not mine personally, but like, having Pokemon cards or something. <laughs> I'm trying to think of what yeah. it would have been when I was younger. And I guess that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with anyone else. So I'm not sure about that. But yeah, I mean, we do live in a more connected generation or a rather world now. And so I can see how that does become a factor. Um, it, it, yeah, it certainly is a little concerning that companies are kind of relying on that to inflate maybe their user numbers and, and relying on the less formed minds of children to keep things going is uh, a little nefarious. Right, yeah, their, their DAOs, their daily active users are so important. I think that there's a conversation in the chat room, so I'll explain a little bit more because everyone doesn't live with a 14-year-old as I do. The reason you would give your password to someone else is they would log into their your account and then they would pretend to be you to chat, to send a snap to you, a chat to you, and then you chat back. So it appeared that you were connecting that day, but really they were logging in as themselves and then they were logging in as you and they were just chatting with themselves. So I hope that's clear. If it's not, tweet at me, I'm at Megan Maroney and I can explain all kinds of things about 14 year olds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is all new to me as well. I'm going to have to come to you for all of my Snapchat news and information now. Right. Uh, please do. <laughs> we had some feedback. Thanks to Sandro George on Twitter who forwarded us this article from Inverse about the 12 coolest uses for AR kit. Now, we've already talked about your interest in the AR hot dog, uh, Micah. <laughs> <laughs> what is the coolest, not necessarily from this article, but what's the coolest thing you've seen so far uh, that from a developer who's used ARKit? Oh, man, there's so many cool things. Uh, when I think of cool, I'm more often thinking of something that's like super practical. And I love the tape measure, the AR tape measure. And people were kind of showing how it, how accurate the, the AR tape measure was. And so you could, you know, in theory, kind of if you had a, a home project and you're trying to figure out uh, where to hang your curtains or how how big a curtain rod you needed or I don't know where you wanted to put your dresser as you were moving into a new place, what have you, you could just pull out your phone and do the measurements with that as opposed to having to go grab a real tape measure like an animal. So <laughs> I think that that's some pretty cool technology that um, shows what's possible. And honestly, all of it just amazes me. I'll be honest with you. I think so much of it is so cool. Yes, there it is right there. I, that's incredible to me. And the, the accuracy is, is very interesting. So as long as you shed a little light on the subject 
and you know you you have a bit of a steady hand there are always the uh, caveats then you're going to get a pretty good measure there and whenever you're not doing that you can just like peek through uh, portals into other worlds and i think that's fascinating as well but mostly i'm interested in the interactive stuff that these developers are starting to build where you can kind of use your phone or a tap to start to add uh, to the experience yeah, I'm amazed by all of this. I like the practical stuff. As you said, I like the impractical stuff, like uh, being able to look out onto a hand, you know, a homemade, man-made lake and see the Titanic uh, floating by. I think that was in this article or uh, painting. The, the one thing from this article that I couldn't really get was there someone developed an app where you could see your food uh, before you ordered it, like see it on your table, yeah. which I thought was, I don't think we need that. I don't know. No, I don't. no uh, I'm right there with you. I when I saw that, too, I was kind of like, uh, no, let's look at some other cool things because that's a little silly. Yeah. I mean, you could like spin it around, but it's just like if I'm already in the place and I can smell the food and I can see the actual real food, it's always going to be more detailed and more realistic. Um, I think one of the other cool things that I saw and uh, this was pretty <laughs> early conceptual stage. Um, too bad you can't reach out and actually like pick it up and start to play around with the food. But um, a pretty early conceptual stage was like an Airbnb integration where you can map out your home. And so then when someone comes into your house uh, to stay for Airbnb and they're like, oh man, how do I change the air conditioner? I can tap and say, you know, I want to change the AC. And then it'll show like a guiding path on the floor and you know it'll point in in virtual space like here's where the ac is and it'll even give you information like an overlay to show you this is how you turn it up this is how you turn it down there's so many applications for that in so many different ways and places and like i could think of because i i end up doing tech support for family members as i'm sure a lot of people who watch and listen to this show do being able to record like an AR experience that shows, you know, a family member how to operate the DVD player or what have you, I think would be really incredible. And yes, they'd have to like tap an app and open it up and be able to hold up their phone. But I think that's a lot easier than like having to read through instructions and not knowing exactly where to press. So that, I mean, the implications are Wow, it just so, it seems so exciting and so so many possibilities there. Mm -hmm. Well, I won't be happy till we have holograms, and so I could see how if I were staying in an Airbnb and then the owner was a hologram, was like, "What? What can I help you? Here's how the blinds work." That's <laughs> what I would like. <laughs> That, yeah, that would be really neat um, until it gets a little creepy because it's like, okay, you can leave now. <laughs> <laughs> I want them to tuck me in the hologram. Oh, my. <laughs> I don't want that. You okay. can have that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, Samsung's Bix Bixby personal voice assistant launched today, and with it came some interesting descriptive tags for the male and female voices. In the settings under speaking style, the male voice was labeled assertive, confident, and clear, whereas the female voice was chipper clear and cheerful. Uh, according to The Verge, Samsung has removed the descriptors. I would say we were both chipper in this episode, and that's fine, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, both chipper, uh, both confident, both clear, both, like all of those would apply to any human being who chose to be that in that moment. <sighs> all right. I know there are going to be people out there griping that this is like a, a not that big a deal and it's mm -hmm. just words and just that. That and the we're other. social justice warriors that we're talking yes. about this. Yes. You yes. know, we're, it's too much. Here's what I have to say. Have, have you ever seen Arrival, the movie Arrival? Yes. Okay, one of the concepts in that film, um, and many of you probably already know, is that our language shapes our consciousness and... Even though there's a lot there, like I don't, I don't think that you know tomorrow if I start learning a circular language, I'm going to be able to travel through time. However, I do believe that our language does shape our consciousness and the language that we grew up with, the uh, the words that we have available to us, because we think with the words that we have available to us, it changes the way that we perceive the world, it changes the way we interact with other individuals, and it changes um, how we you know get along. And so. That's why language is an important thing to talk about and why it's important to call out companies who are inadvertently being sexist, being racist, being what have you. Uh, anything that, that's 
you know, used to close off a group of people or make them feel less than. Those things shape how we think and how we interact with other people and how people are able to get around in the world and exist. And so I don't care if it is just three hashtags underneath a, a voice assistant. It's so important that we treat individuals as human beings and no matter you know who they happen to be on the outside. So that's why I think this is an important topic and I'm glad that it made the list. Yeah, I think, I mean, and, and to me, it's great that they removed it. You know, it's like, oh, they're like, oh, right, uh, thanks. And <laughs> you will change it. And, and the end, you know, it's just, it's like the small, the, 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 it's the small things, I think. So. Yeah, I, I think that, yeah, that's perfectly accurate. The fact that they were like, okay, this is our bad. We're going to make that not a thing anymore. Uh, we messed up and we're, we're learning from. Um, that's the way that you want to go as opposed to like the apology route that, still has those words involved in some way. So uh, good on Samsung for making this change and hopefully this informs future decisions that they make as well. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we can see the future too um, and the past and all consciousness, right? <laughs> yes, yes. The circular <laughs> language will come to us one day. Yes, yeah, exactly. Well, Micah, thank you so much for joining me again. So soon after last week, Micah can be found at iMore on Twitter at Micah, uh, Twitter, at Micah Sargent on Twitter and on the web, chihuahua.coffee. <laughs> yes, there it is. It's got links to all the stuff that I do. Snap codes. If you snap me, I probably won't see it for seven years, but, you know, be my guest. It's fine. Uh, maybe I'll, we can Snapchat hot dog buddy. I don't know how, how does Snapchat work. I'll, we'll have streaks. It'll be great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I want to aim to be that person on your list that Snapchats you a lot more than you Snapchat them. That's my goal. Uh, you know what? I would, that would be great. I would, that would make me happy. I'd pop in. It's like, oh good. I've got, you know, a few messages I can catch up on. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, uh, hopefully see you soon, Micah. Yeah. Thanks for having me again. And uh, yeah, fingers crossed. I'll be back. I can see the future now. So <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> take care. Bye-bye. TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 23 UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can watch and be part of the show in the chat room. You can also email us at TNT at twit.tv. We love your feedback. You can also hit us up on Twitter. We are at Tech News Today TV. You can find all the ways to subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TNT. And if you want to tweet at me, I am at Megan Maroney. Thank you to Brian, our technical director. Thank you to Burke for always being right. Thank you to Kevin for editing the show. And thanks to you for talking tech with us. We'll see you tomorrow.